join in. So again, welcome everybody. My name is Michael Victor. I'm the head of communications and knowledge management at the International Livestock Research Institute, ILRI. Uh, and welcome to this side event uh, for the Nutrition uh, for Growth Summit. Uh, and it's on better nutrition, health and wealth, the role of informal markets within future food systems. Uh, so I will just take you quickly through uh, some tech tips in the agenda and then hand it over. Uh, so just everybody uh, I think has been on a number of uh, Zooms and webinars over the last year and a half. Uh, please put your full name and organization into, the, uh, into your name. So it helps us see where you're from. Uh, you can do that by clicking on the three dots and going to rename. Uh, we like to use the chat a lot to really generate discussion and to, to talk and to really create a conversation. So post comments or questions during, uh, during the presentations. We won't have too many today, but uh, during the dialogue itself, uh, create a conversation. We are recording right now. Uh, and uh, so audio, video, and the chat uh, are visible to us and the organizers. Uh, we will be live tweeting. Uh, so please uh, tweet about the session. Uh, and also we are gonna be using Menti throughout to kind of crowdsource and get comments and thoughts from people. Uh, you can see the Menti code below. Uh, maybe Cynthia, you can put that into the chat for everybody as well. So uh, please start to get ready for Menti because we'll use that after Sylvia uh, presents. So just to give people a quick overview of the agenda, we will have uh, Dr. Sylvia Alonzo uh, talking, uh, just giving kind of why informal markets and what we want to achieve today, a bit of a background. We'll do, again, a participant check-in to check how people uh, are thinking and perceive informal markets. Then we'll have a framing presentation by Alejandro uh, Gorin from IAD. And then we'll really get to the heart of the matter, which we want to jump into, is the panel discussion. Uh, and we have a, a great group of panelists. I'm not going to go through everyone's name here. Uh, and we really want to be able to uh, elicit their responses and also have interaction with the, with the participants uh, here as well. Uh, we are then really uh, honored to have the African uni Union here uh, to give us some comments and some reflections uh, on what they've heard. Uh, and then we'll have a wrap up by uh, Sylvia again, another quick mentee and then closing remarks by uh, Dr. Jimmy Smith, uh, the Director uh, General of ILRI. So with that, uh, I'd like to hand it over to uh, Sylvia Alonzo, who's a senior researcher at uh, ILRI focused on informal markets and food safety. So over to you, Sylvia. Thank you, Michael. And welcome again to all those who have joined the, this side event. So I was tasked um, with giving you the why and the what for this session. So as for the why, why are we having a session on informal markets? Why is it so critical to discuss informal markets now? Well, I'm sure it's no news for most of you that informal markets are very widespread in low and middle income countries. And they are a bit of a double-edged sword. So on the one hand, they provide important services. They sell most of the fresh foods in the market. And um, they also are the, the most affordable source of foods for the poor. On the other hand, we have to acknowledge that they are also a very difficult beast to deal with um, by government. They operate at the, at the sites of legality, may not pay taxes. Um, they have rudimentary infrastructure, definitely not aligned with the latest standards on, on hygiene. And they are seen as dirty and disorganized. Well, that's a picture. I also like to, to give a picture of what they are also, dynamic and, and very organized hubs of innovation. Well, but the reality is that most countries and many governments around the world would rather see these markets disappear in favor of more modern supermarkets, more sophisticated supply chains. But informal markets, there are reasons why they are there. They've been there for long and they are likely to stay for quite a while. So there's no use of us really turning our back um, against them. So if we really want to tackle hunger and, and malnutrition and, and food insecurity, we need to start bringing them on as part of the solution. But in reality, we have no tools. We really don't know very well, and governments don't know really well how to engage informal markets in this food system transformation. And this now takes me to the what. What are we trying to achieve with this session? 
we want to start a, a global dialogue and, and discussion and consultation around how do we best engage with informal markets? Uh, what are the principles of such engagement transforming these informal markets? We are, this, this session is the first step on that process. We are gonna hear from experts, not only from the panelists, but hopefully also from the audience, from their experiences, what has worked, what are actions we can take to engage in formal markets. The learnings from today, we want to develop a draft document that will be then shared online for wider consultation. And once we get input from stakeholders all over the world, we'd like to then transform that into a brief or a document outlining key principles on how to engage with informal markets. So that governments and institutions, as they rethink their food systems and they think on their process of transformation, they can have some principles as to how to best bring informal markets into the discussion. So while well, this is what we are trying to do, and I look forward to the discussion today. So I'll pass it over to Michael again. Thank you. Excellent. Uh... Thanks a lot, Sylvia. And uh, I'm going to stop sharing this and we're going to go to the Menti right now. So uh, sorry, I didn't put the uh, Menti on uh, right now, but the code is uh, the code is uh, 78526. I'll put this in right now. And we'll go to the first questions. Sorry about this. I just need to. Together. Okay. Uh, thank you, everybody. Okay, so we'll put this into the screen. It's going. Sorry about this. Okay, so we we have a couple of mentee questions. Just really to check people's uh, knowledge, attitudes, and skills. And you can see the mentee code up here at top, and we'll put that into the uh, chat as well. Uh, so the first question is just really to check people's knowledge, attitudes, and skills towards informal markets, because there are a lot of different perceptions and ideas around there. So the first question really quickly is, in developing countries, what proportion of all fresh fruit, vegetables, fish, and meat are sold in informal markets? Let's see what people think. Less than 20%, around 50%, or more than 80%. Excellent. So getting a couple of people in there. So no one thinks uh, under 20%, but yeah, many, most everyone, 80%, and that is the correct answer, over than over 80%. So most of the food is sold in informal markets, which really makes it a, a, a huge, important uh, center for food systems as well. Uh, Let's go to the next question. Uh, what's your perception of informal markets right now? Informal markets are dirty, unhealthy, uh, and they need to be shut down. Do you agree or uh, do you agree or disagree? Be interesting to see where people fall on the spectrum. Okay, interesting. Yeah, a lot of people disagree with that statement that they are dirty and healthy and they need to be shut down. Interesting. Two people still neutral. We don't have anyone yet who agrees or fully agrees with it. Again, interesting to see. Great. Uh, okay, interesting to see. We'll, we'll check this back at the end as well, maybe after the, the, after the discussion. Uh, people's ideas might change. Uh, okay, uh, one other one quick, just to get a uh, quick sense of what word best describes informal markets in your own, in your own view. Uh, and while we're getting that, uh, we'd like to just get kind of one word that you feel kind of best describes informal markets. There we go, dynamic, diverse, challenging, great. Uh, so we will come back to this. We're not gonna go and sit and look at what comes up, but please put your, your answers in here and we're gonna come back to that uh, after Alejandro uh, speaks. 
Uh, so let me stop my let me stop my thing and we'll go back to the presentation. Uh, great. Can people see my my screen? Yes, Michael. Okay, great. Thanks, Cynthia. So yeah, I'd like to now have Alejandro Guerin from uh, IAED present a quick overview of informal markets and some of the definitions, relevance, and challenges. Over to you, uh, Alejandro. Thank you, Michael. Um, just judging from the responses, I think I'm, I'm, I'm speaking to the converted here, so that makes my, my job much easier. Um, I just wanna give you a very, very quick overview of what we mean by informal markets, why we think they're important and why we think we need to challenge some of the assumptions about what they are. So if you can, you'll move the slides, right? For me? Excellent. So I guess my first message is it's, it's diverse, the informal sector, and, but also difficult to define exactly. And part of the reason is because there's no such thing, I don't think, as pure informality or pure formality, but rather businesses, uh, enterprises move in a range in a, that goes from formal to informal. So I think we, most of us can recognize what an informal business looks like. It's much harder to do a, a, a to pin down a, a very specific definition. So that's the first thing, and I'll go into, into the definitions in a moment. The second is that even though we're gonna be talking about informal markets, and I think the idea that we have of informality is usually a marketplace where people are selling food. In fact, the, the, the informal sector and the informal food market spans all the way from production to consumption, and it involves all the linkages between farmers processors, transporters, wholesalers, and retailers and consumers. So it really spans the whole chain. So some common characteristics of informal uh, enterprises, they're usually small scale. Um, they're usually outside or on the margins of regulation. That means that they don't fully comply with all the laws and regulations, or they comply some, but not all. They're based on family labor, and that's really important because it characterizes a lot of what happens in these markets, including, for example, the lack of salaries and the lack of contracts and these types of things. Uh, they're also cash-based, and as I said, they don't have formal contracts or records, and this is one of the big headaches for government is this fact, because it is, it's very hard to tax them properly. So if we move on, um, the reason why they're important is there's, there's lots of reasons, but I think the main one is that there's really, really crucial for low income consumers because that's where they find affordable, nutritious, convenient, and healthy food. And often they're the only source of this type of food. So it's not, it's not that they're among the most important, but that they're the only source of food. And this is both cooked and uncooked. And they're not just important for low-income consumers. They're in most countries, as your mentee showed, Michael, they are the dominant uh, sector uh, of trade of fresh food, but also processed food as well. So even though we've seen supermarkets come in really strongly in many countries, in most low and middle-income countries, the informal sector is the dominant one. And it's also a very important, in addition to the food that it provides, it provides jobs, opportunities, livelihoods for a lot of people, particularly young people and women. We move to the next slide. The, the, despite all these very important um, provisioning that they're doing from the point of view of policymakers, it's really a problem. And I think that the approach of policymakers can be characterized from also a spectrum from oblivion, so they ignore it, they don't pay any attention, to active confrontation, harassment. We've heard of police uh, persecuting informal sectors, clearing them off the street. We'll, we'll talk about some of these things in the panel, but just to say that some of the underpinning assumptions, I think, are 
partly because they're perceived by many to be unsafe and hygienic. So you see the picture here selling the milk in little bags for some people. Oh, how can that be? It's dangerous, it's dirty. They're also seen as unmodern. And so countries obviously want progress and they want modernity and development. So how can they have this thing kind of stuck in the past? They're chaotic, they block streets, and very importantly from the point of government, they're illegal and avoid taxes. And we can move to the last one. My The way I, I segue into our panel is that the reality actually is more nuanced. Huh, my timer went off. Just to say the last 30 seconds that, yes, there are problems with health and safety as there is with informal markets actually, but in fact, there's actually a generally low incidence of disease. So we don't see lots of people getting sick from eating in informal markets. Uh, this perception that they're stuck in the past actually is betrayed by the fact that they're dynamic, entrepreneurial, they're adopting the technology that they can within their limited resources. Uh, they're not chaotic, actually highly organized, highly logical and responding to some very clear, if, if unwritten rules. And finally, this issue of illegal and tax avoiding, it's often very true, but that's because the law itself has put them to the side and has built the walls outside them. So hopefully we can get into some of these issues uh, in the panel. So I'll stop there. Uh, and again, I wanna thank the panelists for, for participating. Thank you. Excellent, thanks Alejandro. And really thanks for that good uh, kind of introduction and overview. And that really leads us now to this panel discussion where we have a, an excellent moderator, uh, Thin Le Win. Who is, a, who is a journalist and mod, moderator par excellence. And she'll take us through the moderation of this. We'll also be using Menti. So please do use the Menti. We're gonna be capturing comments and questions that you have to the panelists uh, and really trying to crowdsource your own issues because we do wanna create some principles uh, coming out from this event. So over to you, Tin. Thin. Thank you. Thanks so much for the introduction, Michael, and for getting that name right. Yeah. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Like Michael said, my name is Thin, and I'm a journalist specializing in food system issues, and I'm delighted to be moderating this panel discussion today on the role of informal markets in future food systems. And we have six excellent speakers who will be sharing their insights on this topic for about an hour. Um, how this is going to work is that I'm going to be asking our panelists a few rounds of questions and we want to focus the bulk of our discussion on actions and solutions. Um, and this is because often we tend to dwell on what is not working when we have these kind of conversations but you've already heard from Silvia and Alejandro on the challenges and the perceptions around the negative perception of informal markets to the lack of policy and research and so on. So we want to use the extensive experience of our panelists um, to come up with concrete ideas that would lead to the set of principles that Michael and Silvia had mentioned that can help policymakers to develop policies that reward food safety in informal markets. Like Michael said, again, we will also be checking in regularly on audience response to the discussion, as well as answers to the mentee questions. Now, without much further ado, let me introduce you to our panelists in alphabetical order. May I request the panelists to switch on their videos? And I apologize in advance if I mangle your names. We have Dilia Grace, um, scientist at the Natural Resource Institute UK and also a senior scientist at ILRI in Kenya. Um, Emma Blackmore, research associate at IIED UK. Jane Battersby, senior lecturer in the Department of Environmental and Geographical Science at the University of Cape Town in South Africa. Stella Nordhaugen, senior technical specialist at the Global Alliance for improved nutrition or gain, as you might know, um, in Switzerland. Um, Utpal Kuma Sharma, Director of the Dairy Development Department with the Government of Assam in India. And last, but definitely not the least, we have Vivian Madueke, who is the Managing Principal at Food Health Systems Advisory in Nigeria. Now, we have great speakers with great insights, but 
a bit of a limited time. So I would like to request our panelists to limit their answers to two minutes or so. Otherwise, I am afraid we might have to move on. Now, I'm going to start off the discussion with one issue that came up time and again when I was talking to panelists about this discussion, and it is this lack of trust between informal actors and regulators. Um, Emma, I want to come to you first because you were very involved in the More Milk project and you were identified, uh, you know, you identified some of these tensions in the countries where this uh, project was implemented, this sort of trust deficit I was just talking about. Could you talk a little bit about that, please? Sure, will do. Thanks a lot, then. Yeah, as you mentioned, I'd like to draw on the more milk research that we conducted. This involved a survey of 400 informal milk market actors in Kenya, Tanzania and Assam in India. And um, we conducted several key informant interviews with key stakeholders, including government agencies. And what the research showed, and Alejandro hinted at this in his presentation, was some clear differences in the approaches of governments to regulating and supporting informal milk sectors ranging from adversarial approaches based on criminalization to benign neglect, as we call it. Um, in Kenya recently, the sale of raw milk to consumers has been banned under the dairy industry regulations. But even before this happened, the relationship between informal actors and regulators was characterized by mutual mistrust and negativity. So almost half of the vendors and all the intermediaries, these are the kind of middlemen transporting milk, um, that we interviewed thought that the government had a negative view of them. And this typically expressed itself as harassment, uh, which in reality meant paying bribes to uh, local enforcement officers. Um, and while some policymakers in Kenya do recognize the importance of the informal milk sector for nutrition, this isn't really reflected uh, in how relationships between form informal actors and, and government officials play out on the ground. Ultimately, I, I, I believe that the tensions that I've described don't really help to lay the foundations for improved food safety or enhance the contribution of these sectors to livelihoods or nutrition. Great. Thanks so much, Emma. And, you know, really interesting insights and particularly the, the, the idea of, you know, them being this is harassment. Um, that's really interesting. And of course, for keeping to the time as well. Um, I'm now going to turn to Utbal because Assam is the first state in India, I understand, that started this informal dairy market initiative as a government project. And Utbal, would love to hear from your perspective on why it was important for that directorate, your, your directorate to engage and communicate with those who trade in raw milk, those who are in the informal sector. Uh, thank you, Finn. Uh, and uh, first and foremost, uh, priority for us when we started the uh, Assam Agricultural Competitiveness Project uh, under World Bank funded, it was a World Bank funded project. And we, 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 we saw that uh, this whole milk market was being dominated by uh, the unorganized sector. And that time it was around 97% of milk market was dominated um, by the unorganized sector. And the situation was very, very grim. And uh, looking to the milk production and uh, all over the India uh, average, uh, Indian, uh, it was 60% to 40% all India average. But in my state, it was 97 to only 3 percent and that time uh, World Bank uh, had given us the mandate of organizing the dispersed farmer into organized uh, format so we were given the power of corporate cooperative uh, registration then Hillary also joined us in that project and uh, with uh, so the support of Hillary and from uh, headquarters as well as from local officials we had planned to identify first the who are, who are the milk market actors, like your dispersed producers, traders, processors, cottage processors. So we identified them and we started to uh, this thing, develop a pilot project. How to go ahead with these kind of who are the real contributors to the overall milk market. So my uh, 2019 uh, 20 census, the milk production in Assam is 970 million liter, but but that is uh, the, being the contributor, main real contributors were uh, this thing, the informal uh, milk producers. Great, thank you so much, Abel. That was really interesting. Could you just, I mean, we don't have much time, but if you could just really, you know, focus on why 
uh, why yeah. did you you know yeah. do this yeah, yeah. Uh, so so that time we felt that uh, the consumers are also uh, affected and the milk production they are also not getting they are also neglected uh, really neglected so that is why we developed a pilot project with the help of Eden. and we started identifying uh, the milk market actors and we started uh, talking around along with the health uh, department, department veterinary department municipality and other stakeholders department so that we can develop and identify. And we started giving them the awareness building, the capacity training, et cetera, and how can they improve their economic aspect uh, without, without going for the adulteration and this thing and organizing into a, in a regulated format kind of thing. Then what is quality, other things? So that was a successful program. Great, thank you so much. Um, Dilia, um, you know, as an implementer, and you've heard obviously from Utba how they did it and why they did it in Assam, what's your experience in other countries and how to overcome this trust deficit? Yes, I think it's about uh, incentives and being able for the informal traditional uh, sector, whatever we call it, to be able to, to show that they can produce safe and clean food and often they can it's it's a matter of relatively simple training and relatively simple technologies you know things like different colored cutting boards so that you can separate the cooked food and the uncooked food and if the traditional informal sector starts looking more like a farmer's market and less like like some sort of a chaotic uh unclean environment, then I think that will start building trust in the regulators and the consumers. At the same time, and I, I, I must say that in some countries, we also see conflict of interests. So it goes beyond trust that there are actually um, vested interests, including among uh, governments and, and political players, which would want them to um to, to 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 remove or to be negative to the informal sector and in countries like if i may give the example of india where you have more of a civil service who is is trying to you know improve things deliver services improve things for the populace and have not necessarily got major financial interests in getting rid of the informal sector, we sometimes see better progress than in other countries where there are strong conflicts of interest. Over. Thank you, Julia. That's really interesting, particularly that comparison with the farmer's market. And I guess, yeah, this whole perception around um, aesthetics, right? Uh, that's really quite important. Um, Vivian, I'd like to turn on you now because I'd like to hear the perspective from the private sector. I mean, you've, you know, uh, uh, what are your thoughts on what can be done to build this trust? Yeah, thank you. I must start by saying that um, one of the issues with trust is an unstable policy environment encourages distrust and harassment. And one of the things that can be done is for government to have consistent policies. I use an example. So one of the markets um, that I've worked with, two years ago, the market was demolished. And six months later, after the demolition, they were allowed to come back. Um, and then last year, there was another demolition. Now, if as a business person, I want to invest in improving my standards. I wouldn't want to do that in a place that is unstable. Therefore, to build this trust, the government has to have consistent policies. I think the second one is the informal sector, they have to be involved in the, in the development of policies because currently it's mostly the formal sector that are invited into technical working groups. I think we assume that the informal sector is very unorganized, but they actually have um, some form of organization within them. The question is how do we start involving them in the process to help them understand where the government is coming from, but also, also to see their own perspective. I think that's one way to build trust. The third point is the government needs to focus on mentoring rather than punitive approaches. Currently, there's a form of overregulation where you have several agencies collecting levies and fines from these people 
who are mostly in the vulnerable population or some of them are in the vulnerable population. So I think the burden is on the government to make sure that mentoring is used to support them rather than punitive actions. I think these are the three ways to build trust. Over. Great. Thank you so much. Those are very, you know, real concrete tips. Um, Stella, Jane, um, you haven't gone yet. Who wants to go first uh, uh, talk about this? Jane? Great. Thank you, Sin. Um, and I mean, just really support what Vivian's been saying. And my understanding is there's this antipathy of the state towards the informal sector. And that's really been hardwired into planning and policy. If you look through the sort of planning history of the last hundred years, it's hardwired in. And that has this kind of knowledge effect and governance effect. It, it shapes what the state can do, but it also shapes how they see the system. And so I think there's a couple of things that really need to be done and really building on what, what Vivian said. I think we actually need to go back and really understand what the regulations are, where they've come from, and to, 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 to work to amend bylaws, to work to amend planning codes, et cetera, to enable the state to actually take proactive thing, action. But at the same time, we also need to recognize how these policies and plans and other structures have fundamentally shaped how the state sees the informal sector. And therefore, there's, there's this considerable effort to be done in, in, in sort of, I don't know, changing the hearts and minds by the use of developing better data, um, by incorporating lived experience work in, and by doing things like actively taking the, the government agents into the markets on, on learning journeys to, to actually get them to experience the place. Because I think a lot of people are using the spaces without really thinking them through. So I think there's, there's a role for, for the market associations, for the research entities, for civil society organizations, all to do that work in undoing this, this long-term legacy. Thanks. Great, thank you. Thanks for building it up. And, and we're now already sort of collecting a set of advice and, and things that can be done. Stella. Yeah, I agree with all the remarks from the panelists on finding right fit regulations and listening to the perspective of informal market actors. And one thing I wanted to focus on specifically within that is the importance of paying attention to the cost implications of any types of regulations that are requested. Our work in informal markets in Nigeria has shown that both vendors and consumers are really sensitive to price and cost. And oftentimes informal actors are operating on very thin profit margins and they just don't have much flexibility to make any changes that would result in higher costs. Concerns like food safety, it's not, it's not that they're not, not concerns, um, but rather they're kind of often necessarily subordinate to that very real constraint related to price and cost. And from the perspective of somebody coming from the nutrition community, this is really important because it can have implications also for consumers. Consumers who are using informal markets are often those who are you know, struggling to afford a healthy diet. And by imposing regulations that can increase the cost of highly nutritious food, like fruit and vegetables, animal source foods, that can have a detrimental effect, not only on the informal market actors, but also on the consumers who are dependent on them. So I do think considering um, cost constraints is an important thing to keep in mind when trying to build that trust. Great, thank you so much, yeah, for bringing that uh, aspect into the, into the discussion. Um, thank you to our panelists for, this is the first round of questions. I'm now going to take a few minutes to have a look at what's going on at Menti. Can we have the Menti screen, please? And we ask our audience what other issues um, they think are actually important um, beyond this. And let's have a, a, a look at, you know, what they have said. Um, what do you think are issues related to info market and why they create competition to the big form retailers and distributors? That's why government are pressure to food safety, need to build trust and confidence between governments. Um, yeah, belief system in relation to behavioral change. Um, okay, so these are the issues change related to informal markets and why. Um, we have maybe one or two minutes. Um, if any of the panelists would like to respond or, 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 or have any thoughts. Um, okay, there's another thing that just came out on Menti. We should hear from the traders what they see as issues and need to be priority um, in dealing with, and with this. Um, Delia, uh, Jane, Stella, any thoughts, anything you want to respond to or comment? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. 
<laughs> with the first statement because they, they more or less said what I said, which is that there, there is an inherent conflict of interest. You know, there are vested interests. And if we treat this as purely a technical bureaucratic problem, mm -hmm. we may not get a solution. We need a political economy lens uh, on, on the informality versus formality. Uh, yeah, that was my, my uh, all I had to say. Thank you. Great. Um, actually, we are running slightly behind time, so I'm going to move on to, to the next round of questions. And for this one, I'd like to hear more specific examples of support and upgrade of informal markets, um, so successes and failures, and the specific things that contributed to either the success or the failure, um, so that the set of principles that hopefully will come out of this discussion will have both what to do and what not to do. You've already, you know, gave great examples just now on what are the things to sort of, you know, build this trust. It would also be great to uh, 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 talk about, you know, examples of, of, of success and failure. Um, again, if you could limit your answers to about two minutes, that would be great. And Vivian, I am going to come to you first um, because of your extensive experience advising both the formal and informal sectors, some of the examples that you've seen. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Finn. I, I'll, I'm going to use three examples quickly. The first one is when supporting the formal sector, there are, oh, there are principles out there, for example, HACCP principles that are usually thrown around. However, when it comes to the informal sector, those principles and evidence-based solutions, as we'll call them, need to be adapted to the various segments. A HACCP-based system, for example, in the food safety community, seen as gold standard. However, it is highly documentation heavy and also can you know, cost a lot more. So what we did with the markets we worked with was to support them and train them on the principles, not HACCP, but the principles of food safety. So things like separation that Delia mentioned, using different cutting boards, things like cooking their food thoroughly, things like practicing fest in, fest out. So for those who sell frozen meat products, teaching them how to um, pick products that, had, that were bought previously and selling them first before the new products. So these are you know, some of the examples of adapting world-class standards and getting it to the level of the informal sector. A second example um, I will give is where we made a compelling business case. Stella mentioned that these people are entrepreneurs, right? Um, and it's all about cost. So one of, the, one of the things we did in 2015 was to somewhat support some of the women who sold the products we call Ogi. So Ogi or Kamu is, is like a, a corn soy meal used for weaning children. And that product is nutritionally deficient because it's mostly starch. What we did was to support them to create new products such as corn soy blends where they add soya to it. Now, what that did was to improve the nutrition of the people who bought them, but also it increased, slightly increased the margins of the women who sold it and it made sense for them. So at the end of the day, any solution that we want to create has to be such that makes a compelling business case for those in the informal sector. The third example, which is a really brilliant one, is one called cold hops. As we know, food safety, cold storage is important. So what cold hops did, um, you can Google it cold hops, what they did was to have cooling rooms where informal traders rent spaces daily they pay a small fee, put in their produce and take it out the next morning. Not only does this help them achieve food safety standards, but also it extended the shelf life of their products. It was affordable and the cold rooms were kept in the markets with them. So these are some of the examples of how we can adapt and bring things to the level of the informal traders. Over. Great, thanks Vivian, three great examples. Jane, I'm gonna to come to you now because you have a lot of experience with urban food systems. Can you tell us about the different approaches that you've seen you know, that's been taken when it comes to dealing with the informal sector uh, in terms of urban food systems and, and the results? Yeah, absolutely. So most of our work is in South, Southern and Eastern Africa, um, but we have also worked in West Africa. Um, you know, and. The, the overarching story is the story of antipathy towards the sector. However, there are these pockets of, of emergent change. And so one of the things that's been happening in Mozambique has been local government requalifying markets, which often is a process of, of recognizing where informal markets are and 
not formalizing them, but giving them some kind of formal recognition, which then enables the state to intervene in various ways. It enables, you know, donor agencies to provide infrastructure support, etc. So, so they're thinking about these kind of small governance shifts that can signal a change in attitude and enable change. But we know that that's not enough, right? And so we know that there's various experiments that have taken place that, that have or haven't worked. And so I think one of the things that's really important in the context of these informal markets is to think clearly through who the, who the traders are, what their needs are, and take a particularly strong gendered lens to this. So there's an example that was conducted um, by IDS um, in Dar es Salaam, looking at the outcome of investment in toilet facilities in markets. And they found that actually this had a really interesting gendered effect. It turned out that the female traders were more commonly using the toilets because, you know, where else are they going to go? Um, but they were paying 18 times more to use the toilets than their market fees. And this was having considerable impact on their, their trading viability. So we need to understand these gender dimensions and then need to think about what are the opportunities that arise. And so one very, very quick example is in working with directly with the women traders, new opportunities emerge that might not have been recognized before. So work conducted in Accra in Ghana um, found that actually what women thought was going to be the most useful thing for them and their livelihoods and their families was developing safe spaces for children in markets. And when we start to think about how people actually use those spaces and work with those agents, then we can affect positive change. Thank you. Great, thank you. The gender perspective, that's really, really interesting. Stella, can I come to you and hear you know, all the examples of, of game projects in, in, in many countries? Yeah, sure. I wanted to focus in on just one example, actually. So in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, GAIN implemented a project across several different um, countries in Africa and Asia to try and keep informal markets open and functioning as a source of food and nutrition security during the pandemic. And as part of that, we deployed a set of rapid surveys talking to consumers and vendors about their perspectives on what was the situation in the markets. And one thing that emerged from that was that um, consumers were really worried about the possibility of disease transmission in these kind of crowded markets. And as a result of that, some of them reduced their shopping frequency or the amount that they, that they bought. Um, so with this information, we were able to go to some of the market actors and kind of work with them to understand what were some potential ways that they could respond to consumers' concerns. For example, both vendors and consumers saw that the use of masks and hand sanitizer could be something that would reassure them, but that they weren't being widely um, used or widely available within the market. So we worked with market authorities to make those available within the market. I think this is a nice example because it shows kind of how you can leverage the voice of consumers who are also important stakeholders within markets and who are stakeholders to whom market actors are likely to be very answerable, right? Because that's kind of where, where their bottom line comes from is consumer decisions. Um, so I think it's a constituency that can be brought more into the conversation uh, about moving informal markets forward. Great, thank you. Yeah, and it's interesting because one of the uh, uh, things on men teachers now is to you know talk to the traders, but I guess the important thing is also to talk, talk to the consumers and, and 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 you know making sure that it's a it's a holistic conversation that's going on with all the different actors involved. And Utbal, um, could you tell us a bit more about the joint committee? You know what it is, how it started, and how that has allowed you to establish dialogue and to support. Um, you know, those selling raw milk in Assam. Yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, when we saw that uh, we started uh, the pilot project with the help of the LRE, we and first we identified uh, the informal milk market uh, producers and traders. And uh, we started, uh, uh, then we did the training analysis of those uh, actors. And then we started giving them the, uh, the capacity building. Uh, uh, within their defined uh, time and their destination, because uh, so as per their their convenience, we had uh, giving uh, we had given the training to them at their doorstep, and uh, we formed a working group. Uh, it is called a Joint Coordination and Monitoring uh, Committee, uh, comprising of your health uh, department, uh, food safety, then Assam Agricultural University, Ilri, Veterinary Department, uh, State uh, Municipal Authority and dairy development 
and we had to uh, had the uh, distinct con continuous sitting uh, for the review of the development in our sector and we formed some some groups for monitoring after training how they have adopted the improved practices whether they have improved in real real time or not so we had uh, formed a group among themselves the trained actors themselves and suddenly we 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 also visited uh, from the jcmc we visited to check their, their groups and other things whether in the real field they are actually practicing it or not and ultimately we found that it was a great success for us because uh, some economical parameters on disease control then uh, the clean and hygienic milk and their market access and their economic benefit from the training uh, after adoption of the improved practices uh, they had uh, this thing uh, been uh, profited from the improved practices they had adopted and uh, that that was a successful project and after that based on that successful uh, this thing outcome of their project in the current uh, project of world bank uh, called apart we have developed further because it's a market market oriented project called apart project uh, so under informal sector, we uh, we have Willery as a national knowledge partner, and we have developed the same thing uh, with a larger uh, upscaling of uh, this thing, upscaling of the earlier activities. Thank you. Great, great. Thank you. That's yeah, another very very concrete example. Great, um, Dilia and Emma. I'm aware that I haven't come to you yet. Um, Emma, would you like to go next? And Delia, yes. no, no pressure at all to just go last and wrap it all up with all the examples. Thanks, Din. Yeah, I, I really just want to make the point that I, I don't think criminalization of informal market actors is going to work to upgrade any of these markets and could in fact have a kind of negative impact on, on livelihoods and food security. So our more milk research showed that regardless of the regulatory environment, um, informal milk markets are persisting with up to 90% of raw milk, uh, raw or unpackaged milk being traded in these three countries. Consumers ultimately prefer raw milk. Um, they, it's physically accessible to them. It's affordable. They like the taste and they perceive it as, as fresher than packaged milk. And there are some misperceptions around um, pasteurized milk having chemicals in it, which allows it to have a, a longer shelf life. Um, we found that in Kenya, informal actors can find ways to comply with, with new regulations that are, in fact, um, counterproductive for milk safety. So in Kenya, we had some backstreet pasteurization plants that started to emerge um, to allow actors to comply with the new dairy um, industry regulations. And these, the emergence of these are driven by a need to maintain the affordability of milk for low income consumers and keep, keep the cost of businesses down for informal intermediaries and vendors. But the safety of the, of the milk coming from these pasteurization plants is, is ultimately unclear. There were some issues around machinery breakdown, electricity failure, etc. And other research in Brazil, India and Nigeria has shown that where informal market actors are classified as illegal and treated as such, they actually tend to invest less in infrastructure or the equipment that they need um, or take fewer measures to actually enhance quality and safety. In comparison, um, there's some approaches that show some promise in relation to upgrading informal sectors, um, such as in Assam, including capacity building via training. And those work much better, obviously, in sectors or in contexts where governments are communicating with and collaborating with informal actors rather than criminalizing them. Great. Thanks so much for that, Emma. Dilia. Thank you. Yes, I'd like to give just a quick example about um, uh, wringing defeat out of the out out of the um, jaws of victory, um, which comes from a country in West Africa that shall be nameless. I, I would say that this has been documented in papers, and I think this is peer-reviewed impact factor uh, journals. And I think this is quite important when we're. Uh, politicians won't read them, but it gives credibility uh, to whatever statements and claims, especially when we're making things which are counterintuitive and, you know, might not make sense to people. It's always good to have it written up and published. So to my example, we worked in this very low quality abattoir um, where 
something like 99% of meat was failing to meet standards. And we got it down to 80% of meat failing to meet standards. Uh, may not sound great, but it cost $20. And it generated benefits of $200 just in terms of reduced uh, medical costs. So part of that is what we call the, the, you know, the salami principle. You're not necessarily going to get from pretty bad conditions to excellent conditions to Denmark, but, but you can improve things for low costs and then keep on improving things for also low costs and eventually we'll get there. So the next bit of the, the, the defeat from, from, from the jaws of victory was when uh, they closed down this abattoir and um, moved it to an improved abattoir, you know, built an improved abattoir where all butchers were supposed to go to. And it cost them a lot more because they had to pay a lot more fees. And it was a lot more inconvenient for the customers because it was, you know, not in the middle of town where they like to, to buy their beef. It was outside town. And so the butchers rioted and we ended up with uh, nine dead people uh, in the streets as a matter of riots. And then um, the people who were annoyed at being shot in the streets burnt the local police station to the ground. And then because they did not like the modern abattoir where they had no customers and had to pay more money, they moved back to the old abattoir, but the government had removed their meat inspection services because they wanted people to be in the new abattoir. And um, when we went back to check the food safety, it was much worse than even before we started. So it's just an example of what we sometimes say, you know, that the best is the enemy of the good. And if the informal sector is managing okay, try and help it manage a bit better. Don't try and get rid of us or, or replace it with something else completely different because that might not be very effective. Over. Thank you. Um, that's definitely, I guess, a, a very specific example of what not to do. Um, let's have a quick look again at the mentee because we asked our audience a similar question. We asked them to tell us about a successful project or a good practice, as well as stuff that has failed. Ah, there's already a fair bit of uh, responses on, on, on the mentee on this. Uh, bringing government and decision makers into informal market, no one size fit all solution to improving it. Absolutely, um, taking up talking about the informal make market. I've been involved in training farmers, um, so training seems to be one thing that seems to make a difference. Like with Buzz example as well, um, regulatory issues that seems to be an, a, a reason. For, for, for failures sometimes. Um, looking at, um, actually this is interesting, COVID prevention measures may provide positive influence hygiene practices, like I guess what Stella was saying as well. Um, yeah, Jane or Stella or Vivian, do any of you have any you know, quick thoughts that you want to respond to what these comments that you were seeing on Menti? Yep, Stella. Yeah, just to come in quickly on the point in COVID, um, I mean, that rings true very much uh, for me. I think there's a, the saying, never let a good crisis go <coughs> waste. Um, and COVID has been an opportunity to spark change across many different areas of life. And I think sanitation and hygiene is one where there's a lot of new habits being formed. And there are probably opportunities to leverage that um, for better safety in informal markets in the long term, too. So great comment. Mm, thank you. Um, Jane, Vivian, any thoughts? We still have one more round of Menti questions where I will probably come to you uh, uh, to comment. So if you want to, if you want to refrain this time, that's fine. Any? No? Okay, no takers. Then Let then I was just gonna I was just gonna yeah. say I was really impressed yeah. um, at the coast in Kenya when all the informal kind of vegetable uh, vendors, the dupers on the side of the road, how quickly they had hand washing stations in place and COVID signs and were wearing masks and often reacted much more quickly 
than actually some of the, the, the formal retailers and supermarkets did. That's a great example of, of, of showing that informal actors are organized, right? And they have, and, and they have the motivation as well. Um, last round of questions. Um, and this is actually going to be, um, um, ask, I'm asking all the panelists, uh, the three key things that uh, they would say that national policy makers should consider when coming up with policies, like what would you like to see in the set of principles? And I'm actually going to start first with Udbo because he's coming from the public sector. Um, Udbo, based on your experience uh, with the dairy sector in Assam, what would you suggest or recommend to other policy makers, either in India or in other countries about how to engage positively with the informal sector. Thank you. Uh, first thing is you're uh, identifying, uh, mapping the informal uh, milk market actors, then making their database, then uh, giving their the training from production to the marketing, then you're working with the working group properly with the synergy with the, uh, the stakeholder groups and the penal action is not the right thing. The educative and the surveillance part is also very, very important to bring these informal milk market actors into the ambit of the formal uh, this thing, uh, route, uh, so that the, in the, the organized sector improves uh, and informal sector goes down, the percentage of informal sector goes down. So three things, one is your capacity building of these actors, uh, working in synergy with the, the relevant uh, distinct policy makers and other authorities, no penal action initially, and uh, the lab, the, the establishment of lab, the existing lab strengthening, or creating the evidence-based proven distinct database. Otherwise, how can you will motivate the, what was the, 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 the standard of their milk and milk product before training and after training, whether they have adopted the improved practices or not. These are the three things I have said in suggesting. Thanks. Great. Thanks so much, Arthur. Those were very concrete and concise. Um, Dilia, you've lived and worked in many parts of the world in, in these issues. What would be your suggestion? And if you don't mind, if I can tag on an extra question that has come in from the audience um, that I think would be good for you um, is how do we maintain the safety and quality of high risk commodities from informal markets? So if you, no pressure, just two questions in a little bit over two minutes. Okay, so we, we've actually come up with, um, after working for 15 years in informal markets, we've come up with what we call the three-legged stool or the three pillars of the essentials to get safe food in informal markets. And they are, what well, first of all, incentives, motivations, nudges. So these are reasons to change behavior. Uh, there's been too much emphasis on training and awareness raising and social marketing. And really there's very little evidence that that works in the absence of uh, motivation. And that motivation, it, it, it's, Occasionally financial. In the case of Assam, it was actually having this joint committee, which allowed the milk vendors to work together with the government, and then they had peer to peer monitoring. That's motivation. Uh, so the first thing, it, the essential thing is, is, is motivation and consumer demand, we think can be a powerful incentive. The second thing though is vendors have to be able to respond to that, those incentives, that demand, that pull for food safety. And that requires training, basic training uh, and uh, simple technologies. Like we mentioned, you know, cleaning, having dirty, a, a bowl, a plastic bucket for dirty items, a, plastic bowl for clean items. And then the third thing is the enabling environment. And that means that the authorities, be they, you know, government, municipal, they must buy into this, that they must want to support this, they want must want to promote this. So we, if we have these three things, the incentives for behavior change, 
the capacity to respond to incentives and the enabling environment, we think we, we have a good opportunity to, to improve food safety in informal markets. Um, sorry, I, I missed the second question. Was What was that? Um, very briefly, because the two minutes up, but I think it's it's important to answer this. It's how do we maintain the quality and safety of high oh, risk yes. commodities? I think this take goes back to risk based surveillance, which is is still very rare. Uh, which means that we identify what are the high risk products, and those are the ones where we target our, our surveillance and inspection. So risk targeted surveillance in in three words. Over. Thank you. Vivian, I see you've put up your hand. Yes, so I think in addition to what others have said, one thing that the government should consider is sustainable policies. Because what I see a lot of times is knee-jerk policies that are not based on risk, but based on hazard. So a new thing comes up and they bring up a policy because that's what's sensational, right? So one of the considerations is it should be sustainable and not based on knee-jerk reactions. Um, that's that's uh, I think that's that's one thing I would say. And then the second one, which Delia has has said, is to create public infrastructure. At the end of the day, these informal sectors have lack they lack capital, they have they lack credit, so they need the basics to help them thrive. Thank you. That's great, um, Stella, Jane, Emma. Would you like to go last? And I'm going to call on Stella and Jane to 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 go next. Stella. Yeah, sure. Um, so as, as I mentioned a few times already in this session, informal markets are really essential for nutrition. And I think there are three ways that policymakers can leverage that link to better support informal markets. The first is that when aiming to support informal markets, policymakers can engage the nutrition sector. Um, oftentimes, they're used to working with market development authorities or commerce or trade, food safety, not necessarily nutrition. But nutrition actors are a ready constituency that should care about informal markets and might not come with some of the same negative biases that other sectors have. Um, so it's a great constituency to, to leverage to support markets more. Second, I'd say it's really essential to consider the nutrition implications of any policies that are aiming to address other aspects of informal markets. Any policy regulation that you put in place that limits access or increases the price of fresh, minimally processed foods like dairy is likely to have negative implications for nutrition, particularly for the most vulnerable. So it's really important to think about those linkages when putting in place any policy regulations. And then finally, I think it's important to consider any potential win-wins for nutrition as well as food safety, livelihoods, and other aspects. For example, I think the um, example that Vivian brought up earlier about the kind of cold rooms in markets is a great one because that's something that can increase the quality, reduce the loss of a highly perishable, likely highly nutritious product like fresh vegetables. So probably it will have positive implications for access to and affordability of those products with positive implications for nutrition, as well as for livelihoods, food safety, and all the other things we care about. So I think there's some, some great points in which we can leverage the nutrition and full importance of informal markets to better support them. Great, thank you, Stella. Jane, three things, one thing, five. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Tim. Yeah, so when you started, you, you said national government, but I think actually most of the levers are sitting at the local government or subnational level. And, you know, so things like environmental health, things like planning, all those are local government competencies. And so I think there needs to be a, a lot of capacity development done at the local government scale in order to enable those sectors to, to be more responsive, to, to create a more enabling environment. But I do want to finish off with, with a, an example of something that we're just starting to get going in Cape Town, but I think it's perhaps instructive of the way we can think about process going forward. So we've completed a piece of research working with, with women consumers, and they themselves have developed a set of nutrition ambassadors at the, at the community level. And one of the things they've identified is they're concerned about the safety of street foods and markets. But when they talk to the traders, the traders say they experience kind of governance from on high. The environmental health people come, they check the permits, they shut them down, they move, they don't quite know what's, what's going on. So these ambassadors have now approached the city through their environmental health officers to arrange for the environmental health officers to come and speak to the, to the nutrition ambassadors to help them understand what the requirements are, help them understand what levers they might have 
for those people to then go and speak to the traders in a language they understand, in a time frame they understand, and help them to then be responsive. And so I think it is about new ways of thinking about governance, new ways of thinking about connecting state and civil society and private sector actors to 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 enhance the, the safety and viability of these businesses. Thank you. Great, thank you. And yeah, great point about talking about local governments, not just the national level. Um, Emma. Yeah, so three points. Um, I'll be brief. I think a lot of them have been reflected by the panelists already, but really creating opportunities for dialogue and communication between policymakers and informal actors. So making sure that governments are giving space and voice to informal actors in decision making spaces, for example, in dairy boards, making efforts to understand and build on what informal actors are actually already doing to manage health and safety. Um, so in our more milk research, we found lots of examples of, of what informal actors are already doing to try and ensure quality and safety. They're washing their hands. They're keeping their premises clean. They're wearing hair nets. Um, they're cleaning the, the equipment that they use to, to serve milk or to store milk. Um, several vendors, retailers are also using fridges, but they're challenged by kind of unreliable electricity supply. So that was a, a business challenge for them. But in addition, all consumers are, are boiling milk before they're drinking it. And that's a really effective way to ensure that milk is, is safe before drinking it. So my second point would be build on what, what's already being done and understand what's already being done. And then thirdly, um, and I think this has been touched on a number of times, but policymakers should facilitate access to finance so that informal actors can upgrade their premises or their equipment um, and upgrade infrastructure so that they can access regular supplies of electricity or, or clean water. Great, thanks so much for insights. And yes, we can see some commonalities between some of the things that you've mentioned as you know key. And I'm hoping that that also means that you know some of the principles that come out of this discussion, you know, those will be reflected there. Um, I wish we had another half an hour um, so that I can mine your brains on how you know to get more out of this. But we're going to have to end the panel discussion soon. But before I pass the floor back to Michael, let's have one last mentee check-in. And this time we asked the audience, what is the one priority action which could be done in the next one year to make informal markets healthier and safer? So pretty um, time bound and pretty strict um, action oriented as well. Investment in technologies, political and financial solutions. So yeah, tech, finance, uh, public investment. Yeah, so investment again, um, and entry points, uh, international donors need to uh, be taught about informal markets. They can't continue with the prejudice many still have. I'm sure all of our panelists will agree. I see Vivian nodding. <laughs> um, improve policymakers awareness and recognition of the importance of informal markets. Um, so Vivian, Jane, Odpa, you haven't had a chance to respond to some of these mentee things very briefly. I'd like to give three, the three of you opportunity to either for this particular, you know, mentee questions that you're seeing on the screen or just in general, you know, just summary from, from, from the last hour very briefly. I, Vivian, I, I, I'll ask you to go first. Yeah, I, I smile because that was one of the points uh, I noted the international NGOs and philanthropy need to be taught about informal sector, or maybe even if not taught, they need to factor them into their nutrition, food safety, food system strategy, right? And also not just factoring them beyond capacity building. I think a lot of work needs to be done with consumers because at the end of the day, the informal sector are entrepreneurs, they are businesses, and there has to be business case for any improvement so the more we can create demand from consumers then the, the better so in summary ngos philanthropy specifically as they think about technical support to countries they should focus on consumer education thank you great thank you Utpa, any reflections any thoughts from either the mentee or from the discussion yeah, uh, uh, the international cooperation uh, from the big uh, NGOs and other international institutions, they should come up uh, with uh, and take the issues with the local government or national government to have the policy uh, framing and other things. Because uh, being uh, the highest producer uh, of milk in around in the world, uh, the USA doesn't um, uh, procure milk from India because the informal market is uh, the main cause of their initial mm -hmm. microbial load is, is so high 
that USA cannot uh, go for this thing, risking their milk business. So that is why uh, the, the trust between the formal sector, the formal processor and the unorganized sector or informal milk market, that should be created through some international bondings so that, so that a mutual trust is developed the informal sector is not neglected and they are more encouraged to uh, have more milk production to adopt the improved practices so that they can be suddenly they can be brought to the higher standards and the percentage of the informal sector can be uh, brought uh, down third thing is your the, the creation of the database of these in produce informal milk uh, market actors because right now we do not have the actual database and the airport easy traceability of these important groups. They are also the real contributors. Even though they are the real contributors, they might, the state may not have the real database uh, with uh, the, all the states or any uh, country. So they are to be they are to be brought into the main limelight. Limelight, they limelight they are because they are the they are, so we should give the social recognition. That is social recognition and not no neglect neglect uh, this thing issue for them that is why that only that is they will come up uh, to join the formal group improve themselves so that is the thing yeah great thank you so much Rupal. jane i'm giving you the last word thank you yeah i mean i think what we need to also be quite cognizant of is that most of the decisions that are shaping our informal markets our informal food markets are, are taken without any thought about food and so, you know, they're being shaped by economic policy. They're being shaped by urban development policy. Those fundamentally shape these sectors, but, but the decision makers are not cognizant of that. So I think obviously there's work to be done within the nutrition sector. And I think th these conversations we're having today are really crucial, but I think it's important that these conversations go out into the, into the wider planning and development communities to make, to, to bring that awareness of the impact of some of these macroeconomic, microeconomic, um, spatial planning policies on this sector. And I think that's probably where the challenge goes next. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Jane. That was a great, great ending to the panel discussion as well. Like, you know, we've been talking about the informal markets. We've been talking about all the things around it without actually talking about the food aspect, which is the you know key. So no, thanks for, thanks for bringing that. Um, we have come to the end of the panel discussion. Can we give a virtual round of applause to our excellent speakers for their insights, please. Um, and of course, thank you also to the audience um, for your comments and, and the mentee notes. I'm going to now pass the floor back to Michael, um, who will be introducing the wrap up and the, 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 and the summary and other, other presentations. Michael? Thanks a lot, Thin. That was really, really great to everybody. Thank you, Thin, for really you know, moderating a great panel, asking the insightful questions, and really thank you to the panelists for some really great, great ideas. I think Jane said it best, and actually we have that right here. So Jane said, how do we get out to the, to the uh, development you know, world and how do we get down to the practitioners? And we're really honored right now to have uh, uh, someone from uh, the African Union, NEPAD, to give us uh, some ideas and some reflections from what she's heard over the last hour. So I'd like to welcome uh, Ms. Uh, Kefele Wei Roba Molasi, uh, who is the project manager for, the new, for nutrition for the African Union Development Agency, NEPAD. And again, huge apologies for uh, uh, not pronouncing your name perfectly, but uh, Kefele Wei, could you uh, please uh, uh, put on your camera and unmute as well? And we look forward to hearing your comments. There we go, great. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, perfect. You look great, it's perfect. Okay, so I'm sorry, you know there's so many things happen. I had to ask an emergency call. If you could put the question again, please. Victor? So, yeah, so Kefa, we just, you know, it was, you know, we heard a lot here. And from your perspective, you know, at the development agency of the African Union, what do you see as some key issues that you can take forward, uh, some key principles, or what do you see as the next steps here? And how, how can you guys, how can you take this forward at the African Union? Thank you so much. Any reflections um, you have? That, would be great. Yes, that was actually very interesting uh, discussions uh, from the past um, 
previous uh, um, um, speakers. And for us as AD and APAD, we really support the informal sector because that's where our economy in Africa comes from. It's a big business, it's a huge employer and we continue to play a key role in the future development of Africa. So within the African Union, for example, we have developed some programs and initiatives that boost the social impact of the formal sector. Uh, for example, one of the programs that we are doing that is quite doing very well now is on the home gospel feeding program, whereby we actually work with the local work with the local producers, you know, by creating a stable market for them through the schools. And uh, the issue of food safety was also raised. We do also work uh, in bed for safety and in part of the food supply chain to the school. We ensure that our cooks also they understand personal hygiene. For example, they cook food from their home and they have to carry the food uh, uh, to the school. So we ensure that the food safety also it's part of the, the school feeding program. We do have also farmers associations for smallholder farmers. We do work with them closely. We have the different programs such as the Comprehensive Africa Agriculture Development Program is a big program that most of the African member states here do comply to abide to. So ensure that in there, we boost the, 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 the smallholder farmers role and we ensure that we provide uh, training. We do collaborate with different uh, uh, partners, you and family uh, donors as well to train them. For example, FAO is, has been training some of these farmers on the importance of uh, food safety. And uh, we're also developing uh, food safety guidelines that we also try to maintain uh, the safety of this informal market. Uh, if you may be aware also, we have established the Africa continental free trade area, which is based in, um, in Ghana, in, in Accra, to ensure that we also boost interregional trade and we want to ensure that the informal sector are not uh, are left behind. And all this is the effort of building towards the Africa that we want, uh, which is the agenda 2063. Over to you. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, that's great. Thank you so much, uh, Eloy. That was really good. And again, we look forward to working with you in the African Union in developing these next steps and these principles further and really getting them onto the ground. So thank you very much. Uh, and uh, with that, I'd really like to, uh, I'd like to now bring on uh, Sylvia, who's going to provide a quick wrap up uh, and then the next steps as well. So over to you, Cynthia. Thank you. Uh, sorry, yes. Sylvia. <laughs> it's okay. Sylvia. <laughs> thank you, um, Michael. Thank you, everyone. It was a very rich discussion. Um, yeah, I was, I wanted to provide a little bit on a, a, a summary. Obviously, it won't, be a, it won't be a full summary of all the things that have been said. Um, but as people were speaking, I was um, reflecting upon what are these learnings that we are taking away um, on, on these principles of, of engagement. Uh, first of all, I think the, what I noticed is how the panelists have really um, provided a very positive image of the informal markets, which is not what we often would are used to seeing, really. Um, so thanks for that. I mean, we haven't shined away from, from speaking about the challenges with safety and, and governance. Um, but yeah, all in all, I think we are all positive that, that there's a lot that could be done with them. And in terms of principles, there are a few ideas that resonate with me from what the panelists have presented and also the audience. The importance to engage and to bring informal markets to the discussion table and to the policy making table. Uh, we need um, new ways of thinking about governance of informal markets. We need to give them a voice and create policies that are relevant. And this is Vivian spoke a lot um, to this. Um, the importance to bring to the table the, the right set of actors, including other departments in government, the nutrition groups, and, and all other sectors that are making decisions that are shaping the systems. So yeah, engaging, bringing them to the table, participation and inclusion. So making sure that we hear from them on solutions so that other solutions that we propose um, will actually be suitable and tailored to the needs of the informal market. And more than anything, um, as Stella pointed out, they have to make a, a business case. They have to be a business case. Otherwise, they won't be implemented. The importance to have always on this a gender lens to avoid um, um, affecting um, or affecting inequalities. And this is what Jane reminded us. Um, a third point is the need for investments. Investments on technological, 
in financial solutions, nothing in innovations, nothing of this will happen without the right set of um, investments, because nothing of this will be done for free. And then more down to the, the informal sector actors themselves, the importance of capacity building and training and kind of giving them the skills, not only the technologies, but actually the skills um, to be able to, to operate um, in, in, a, in a better way. Um, but as Delia reminded us, capacity building by itself and knowledge is not enough. Those, that capacity building needs to also be linked up with incentives, incentives that drive behavior change. So whether that comes through um, leveraging consumer demand or other forms of incentives, that, um, that's very important on, on our engagement with informal markets, especially when it comes to addressing issues like food safety that was brought up as one of the main issues. And finally, uh, the importance to bring the international community on board. I think often we just try to think on local solutions. Well, probably in this case, we actually need a change of, narr uh, a change of narrative um, internationally on what these informal markets are and, and how we should actually respond to their needs. So this is a lot of rich ideas. It's not, there's many more that have come up. We'll actually um, take all the notes um, together and try to, to draft a more consolidated document that will go out for um, consultation. So all of you that have registered will, will receive information when that time comes. And we really look forward to continuing um, having your input and, and your, your ideas into the process. So that will be all from me, Michael. Thanks so much for facilitating this and over to you. Okay. Uh, thanks a lot, Sylvia, not Cynthia this time. Uh, and uh, really great, great synthesis and really do please join us in the next steps because this is not just ending with this webinar, but we really wanted to take this forward. There are some <coughs> questions on the Menti and you can please go to the Menti and put in your responses. Really, what, what did you learn about this session? And then another question about what you commit to. So we'd like to see that, but we're also running uh, close on time. So we'd like to keep the time. So I'd like to uh, hand it over to uh, uh, Dr. Jimmy Smith, who's the Director General of uh, ILRI, to, to give us kind of some final closing remarks for this session. So over to you, Jimmy. Thank you, Michael. And thank you, Cynthia. I hope you can hear me. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, good. Um, since you provided a summary, she described it as not exhaustive, but a rich summary. I found that panel session extremely rich, meaningful, insightful, punchy. I could add many more adjectives to that. It raises several points in my mind. One is, if this is so important, why doesn't it get more traction? And we know it's important because the figures I have says that more than 80% of the food is produced and consumed in the same country. And most of that food is sold in informal markets or traditional markets or wet markets, whatever you want to call them. So, so many people, most people, and particularly the rural poor, get their food from these markets. They're incredibly important, but they're always under siege. Why, why is that the case? Well, perhaps policy biases, and we hear we heard many reasons why that might be the case. But perhaps also that some of the bad things which have happened globally more recently, such as pandemics, have often been blamed on these markets. So just as the time when they were emerging, uh, gaining traction and becoming a, a recognized part of the food economy, there have been these setbacks. Nonetheless, I think what this panel discussed and the many dimensions of the issues need to be addressed because these markets will continue to be very important for the vast majority of consumers 
into the foreseeable future. It is paradoxical that we regard these markets so negatively in developing countries, when in developed ones, a particularly great pastime is to go to the farmer's market. Well, these markets, these informal markets, rural markets are for all practical purposes. The farmer's markets of the developed world that are cherished and are seen as a place for getting your most fresh, wholesome foods. So can we, can we manage to change the narrative to make these informal markets be seen in the future as we see the so-called farmers markets in the developed countries? And we learned a lot about what we can do about that. The first thing is to make them um, make more people understand, particularly policy makers, how important they are to food and nutritional security, the livelihoods and so on. And then we must work with the political economy of this. And many talked about that building trust, stable policies and, and so on. There are lots were offered today about what we can do to make these markets more wholesome, to deal with the issue of risk-based rather than hazard-based approaches training and certification, and so on and so on. So I am leaving this conversation in a very positive mood today. At ILRI and in the CGIAR, we have been working in this area for a long time. Delia and, uh, and others have been at the forefront of this at ILRI certainly with our partners around the world, such as Uppal and others. So I think we need to redouble our efforts with all the partners who we've had here today to change the narrative about these markets and to put them more squarely in the forefront of sustainable food systems and of course, food and nutritional security not only for the rural poor, but for the vast majority of the people in most developing countries. Well, Michael, I am I was delighted to be invited to this. I uh, this was really a good hour and a few minutes spent. So let me thank the panel again: Jane, Okpal, Delia, Vivian, Emma, and Stella. And Kelefi Way from the African Union for their participation. I hope we can take this forward, continue to drive this agenda, and count on Hillary as a very important partner to work with you in this endeavor. Michael, thanks very much. Excellent. Thank you very much, Jimmy. And again, thanks, thanks to all the participants and all the panelists. That was a, a great uh, session. Uh, and again, we'll have some, uh, we'll have a blog out of this and we'll also have the principles which we'll share uh, to get feedback uh, from everybody. So thank you very much.